Hello again. This is the third lecture in the ESL 346 series. A memo is short for memorandum. The Merriam-Webster Dictionary defines a memorandum as a usually brief written message or report from one person or department in a company or organization to another. The plural of memorandum is memoranda, but when we use the abbreviated form, we say memos. Memos are usually internal. They're generally disseminated by email these days, or they can be posted in a public place, such as in a break room. If your memo is to one person or a small group of people, you should address the memo to them. A typical example of such an address is on this slide. Just as with email, your header, or subject heading, is important. Recall that a header is like a newspaper headline, and it is generally a summary of the point you will make. If you are writing to several people, you need to think about how to organize the recipient's names. In most cases, the best way is to organize them alphabetically. However, if you're including the president of your company, and her name is Jillian Zabinski, you would probably not put her name last on your list. You would put her first and then follow with the rest of the names in an alphabetical order by last name. From your textbook on page 64, good memos and letters can do a lot of things. They can solve problems, clarify issues, straighten out misunderstandings, raise questions, answer questions, spread the word, complain, mollify, cheer up, praise, etc. That's a lot for the written word to achieve. Try really hard to make it as brief as you can. If you can keep it to less than one page, great! Hardly anyone reads a second page of anything. And even then, most people only get as far as the first half of the first page. In American business writing, there's no need to begin with the flowery phrases that used to be common a century ago. Get right to the point. If your memo includes a call to action, something you're asking someone to do, you might want to put this right up front, even in your header. If people know they have to do something, they're more likely to read it. Keep calm and carry on were the famous words on a British motivational poster from 1939, the start of the Second World War. There have been many variations on this now, printed on t-shirts, mugs, and even jewelry. Take this advice to heart when you're considering writing your memo. As with email, humor hardly ever works, nor does sarcasm. And anger has a tendency to rebound right back on you. So no matter how you're feeling, your business memo should be calm, reasoned, and professional. Um, yes, they do write letters, but it seems that letters are hardly good news unless they contain money. Legal and financial concerns are indeed generally carried out in writing, although what a lawyer calls a brief is anything but brief. Medical issues are also sensitive, and medical providers are wary of email simply because it is so insecure as we said in the previous lesson. Very often, a document is introduced by a cover letter, which should be long or short, depending on the circumstances. Let's look at how to start your business letter. Okay, let's admit it. Many people's names are difficult for us to spell. Here in the United States, we have people from all kinds of backgrounds, ethnicities, and language groups and their names are usually not Jim Smith. So the first rule of addressing a business letter is to get the spelling of your recipient's name right. If you're not quite sure, ask someone. For example, how many R's are in Barack Obama's name? One or two? How do you spell Nguyen, a common Vietnamese surname? Another issue is that American 
first given or given names are frequently gender neutral. Is Terry a man or a woman? How about Dakota? My own first name as an example is actually Gru, G as a nickname. Norwegians would recognize it as a female name, of course, but you would be surprised at how many letters I get addressed to Mr. Frydenberg, who, by the way, would be either my brother or my father. Here are some spelling variations I have often encountered. In memos, we have recommended that you put your ask, your request or call to action, right up front. However, in business letters, it's more common to put it at the end. And please divide your letter into paragraphs to make it easier reading. Three paragraphs should normally suffice. One for the single sentence main point of your letter, a longer paragraph to describe why, and a short paragraph at the end with a direct explanation of what you're asking, recommending, promising, and so on. It may be a little difficult to know how to end a business letter. The most common and neutral sign-off is the word sincerely, or you could say sincerely yours. A few other sign-offs are common as well, but in my opinion, they sound a little bit too personal for a business letter, such as best wishes. Do you really think I'm in danger of doing something stupid, so you need to wish me luck? Or all the best. All the best what? And the ending, yours truly, does sound like it came from the last century. You're better off sticking with sincerely and a comma. On this slide are a few examples. Then leave a couple of lines empty, one or more lines if you intend to hand sign the letter, and then type your name. Below your name goes your title. If you're not using company letterhead with contact information, such as the appropriate email address and phone number, include that as well underneath your name. Once again, it's important in American business letters to state what you want right up front. It's frequently a secretary who opens letters and he or she will need to decide to whom to forward the letter very quickly. So for that reason, follow these three rules. State what you want, explain why you want it, thank the recipient, and that's it. It's short and to the point. Now this type of letter is both harder to write and harder to receive. Basically you have to turn someone down and that will disappoint that person. So you need to be as diplomatic and sensitive as you can. Consider the situation on this slide. You are an insurance company that provides long-term insurance to older adults. As you know, insurance in the U.S. is a business that must be profitable. For that reason, this company has a policy that all people requesting such insurance must pass a medical exam showing that their health is good for their age. An older woman has applied, but her medical exam shows that she has diabetes and heart problems. You need to write a letter denying her the insurance coverage. First, make it personal. You'll see on this slide that the writer has begun with Dear Mrs. Wilson, instead of just applicant. Next, the writer sympathizes with the unknown applicant. In the second paragraph of the letter, the writer proposes alternatives for the applicant, but please note that the writer is careful to use the verb may. The writer needs to be careful not to promise too much, since he has no control over the alternatives he proposes. Finally, he closes with a simple wish. Dear Mrs. Wilson, I'm very sorry that our insurance company is unable to offer you the long-term care policy that you seek. As you recall, approval of such a policy depends on the successful passing of a medical exam, and I'm sad to see that you have several health issues that disqualify you from the policy. I would encourage you to seek other options. For example, the Federal Affordable Care Program may be able to offer you some choices of a policy. There may be centers near you that can give you advice. We wish you the best of luck for a long, happy life. Yours truly, Donald Donaldson. 
Our third type of business letter is probably the most common, a complaint. While a lot of correspondence can be sent via email these days, it is unlikely that you'll get very far through an email complaint. People are drowning in email to such an extent that only the highest priority messages get through. The main point of the complaint letter is not to complain. It is to get something done. Yes, you're unhappy, but so what? What do you want the company to do for you? In the example on the next slide, the writer is extremely unhappy because the airline Shoddy Air managed to lose both her and her son's suitcases when they flew to Europe to take a cruise. Even worse, the suitcases never made it to the ship and the Hill family had to cruise in the same clothes each and every day. You can understand that unhappy is an understatement of how they feel. Let's see how Mrs. Hill phrases her letter of complaint. Dear Miss Smith, I'm requesting a full refund of the value of two lost suitcases. The total value, as you can see from the contents list, is $3,375. On March 1 this year, my son Thomas and I flew to flew Shoddy Air from Burbank to Antwerp via Philadelphia, Reykjavik, and Stansted. Copies of our travel documents are enclosed. As you can see from the report we filed in Antwerp, neither of our suitcases arrived. Since Shoddy Air does not allow carry-on baggage, we did not even have a toothbrush. The airport baggage representative, who barely spoke English, assured us that the suitcases would be sent to Amsterdam, where we were to join the cruise. They did not arrive, neither in Amsterdam nor in any town or city where we docked. It has now been a month since we returned to our home in Brentwood, and we have repeatedly called the Shoddy Air representative to no avail. A copy of this letter has been sent to our attorneys, Dewey, Cheatham, and Howe. I expect your immediate response. Luckily, while most of the staff at Shoddy Air are not the brightest bulbs in the chandelier, their customer service director studied business writing at Saddleback College, and he knew what to do. Here's his response to Mrs. Hill. Dear Mrs. Hill, how unpleasant it must have been for you to have your personal belongings missing from your great vacation. However, you did have a lovely time on the rivers of Europe in spite of this mishap, didn't you? Unfortunately, our company policies only insure baggage up to $1,000 per bag. I cannot say why your bags were misplaced or and which airport or system may have misdirected them. For this reason, I would ask you to complete the enclosed missing luggage forms and return them as soon as possible to my direct attention. I will give the matter my immediate and full attention. Sincerely, Abraham Smith. Thanks for watching this lecture. At this point, you should go on to the two videos giving more detail of a business memo and some practical details of a business letter. After that, Please turn your attention to the discussion thread for this week, which examines potential differences in how business letters are different in different countries.